there. This is Monica Volkmar. I wanted to take the time today to answer a question from one of my students from my Liberated Body Workshop. Uh, because I think that this question relates to more than just this one student. I think this is a thing that a lot of us are asking and are struggling with. So this is from Annie. And Annie asks, or she was telling me, and I asked her how she's doing, checking in, how's your body? She said, my body is doing all right. I'm still not able to move without pain like I used to, but also I find myself not really taking the time to do the exercises we went through and continuously do my stretches. I'm not really sure why there is such resistance. Does this happen with your other clients? And I think this question brings up an issue that tons of people are struggling with. Why can't I do the dang work that I know I need to do? And first of all, the fact that Annie has an awareness of this is amazing. Just the fact that she recognizes that this is her work to do is the first step. A lot of people haven't even taken this sort of responsibility and think that their inability to get free from pain or get out of whatever situation their body is in is everyone's fault but theirs. Maybe they have things, excuses, like the physio is too expensive, so I didn't go back. So it's not my fault I didn't get better. Or the exercise doesn't work the first time I did it, so obviously that's not my fault. Or I'm just doomed to be in pain. This is just part of my natural condition. Nothing can change. Or nothing works. Um, these are all excuses that put the blame on something else without taking responsibility. So Annie already recognizes that she needs to take responsibility and she just wants to know why is it so dang hard? Why am I not making this important? Why is she experiencing the resistance to doing the work? And when it comes to improving the way we move or getting back into activities that we love without flaring up pain symptoms and old injuries, if that's something you're dealing with, that's something that I deal with every day. The what to do is pretty common sense, actually. The first thing is we need to assess the problem. Is it a joint restriction? Is it something muscular or a fascial restriction? Is there a repetitive movement or something that you're doing that you just need to stop doing? Is there an old injury, like an ankle sprain you had at age 12 that isn't finished healing, so you need to get some work done there? Are you just not moving enough generally? Do you need to go for a walk every day? So we need to assess what the problem is. That's pretty simple, or maybe not simple, but it's pretty common sense and it's an easy step to take. Next, we need to know what the solution is. So maybe that's an exercise that you can use to improve your mobility, or maybe it's removing that activity you identified that is causing your body harm. Maybe you just need to make the appointment to go get some treatments for that old ankle sprain so that it can fully heal. Maybe you just need to walk every day. <laughs> so we know step one and two, that's very rational, very intellectual. We all know these common sense things. The third step though, is doing the work. Just do the dang thing you know you need to do. One and two are the easy part. Step three is where most people fail. Most people just can't get themselves to do the work. So if you're like me or you're like Annie, that is the hardest thing to do. Now to give a bit of background about Annie, since she's someone that I know in real life, before the situation with COVID went down, we were. We started doing some sessions together in person. And then online, she recently did my Liberated Body four day workshop. She also had a look at my Dance Stronger program, which was my brainchild back from 2015, in which I put down a ebook and a strength training and movement program to help dancers learn to prevent injuries and perform better and not make the silly mistakes that I made. But that's a whole other conversation to have. So Annie is a dancer and an actor, and she's been suffering from what she initially told me were mysterious pain symptoms that she has no clue where they come from or why her body is hurting. And now Annie's really smart. She knows what she has to do. She's also worked with some brilliant practitioners here in Toronto, ones that I would recommend anyone go see. So 
I also showed her some exercises and things. So she's had a ton of support. She's got a lot of information. So those are not the problems for her. Her problem is the resistance that she identified. Why is there such resistance to doing the work? So what is resistance? For me, resistance was a funny term when I first encountered it. I didn't really know what it meant because I didn't think it applied to me. So I think an important step is to recognize you will feel resistance. We just need to name what it is and recognize it when it shows up. So for me, resistance usually takes the form of a little voice in my head, a little blip that if I'm not aware, it'll come and go and it'll, I won't even notice it. So it slides right under the radar. But pay attention to when you start to notice a message telling you that this isn't important or I don't want to do that, or I don't know how to do that, or it's too overwhelming, or I don't have the time for that. It's too complicated. I'm not motivated. I'm too tired. I'm scared. I'm embarrassed. What will people think if I do that? I have this other thing that's more important, so I'll do this later. And on and on and on. These things show up in many different ways for all of us. So I don't know exactly which is the case for Annie. We have to have a further conversation personally. But since I know her, I know what isn't her resistance. I know what isn't her problem with this. It's not that she doesn't know what to do. She has a ton of information. And it's not that she doesn't have the support. At the very least, as a student of my Liberated Body Workshop, she has me through the magic of Zoom, and she has the online learning platform I've created where she can do classes weekly that will help her to engage in the work she needs to do. Um, she can even, you know, do a personal check-in with me or anyone that she's ever worked with. I'm sure if she emailed one of her practitioners that she's worked with in the past and said, hey, I'm running into this problem, can you help me? She would have the support. I know she has a solid support system of friends too who would absolutely encourage her to do the work she needs to do. That's not the problem. It's not that she's lazy either, because guys, she's a freaking actor and a dancer. And do you know how much grit and perseverance and determination and hard work and effort it takes to make that work as a career? And she's done this. So that's not her problem. It's not that she needs to work harder. She knows what it means to work hard. And it's not that she, has, she doesn't have a reason either to get well. She relies on her body for work, and so she understands that pain is going to impact on that, and if she can't overcome it, it's going to eventually impact on the quality of her life the longer it goes on. So the problem, I want to re reiterate, is that it's not what to do, it's that there are these belief systems and mental blocks getting in the way of taking action on what she knows is important to do. Now, resistance gets paralyzing when we aren't able to name it and meet it for what it is. Because resistance is often fear. And fear doesn't always look like fear because we don't always want to admit that we're scared. We live in this society where admitting that we're afraid of something is seen as bad. I will admit to you right now, I'm freaking scared. This situation right now with COVID, it has shaken my life. And to admit that I'm scared, I think that a lot of people are afraid to hear that because it will make them realize that they need to admit that maybe they should be scared too. And it's not bad to be scared, but what causes a problem is when we can't admit that we are. And this is how resistance slips under the radar because we've been taught that fear is bad. But here is the truth. Fear, the very presence of it is the indicator that this is the thing you need to move into that will lead you to living out the highest result of yourself, the one that you want to live out. So whenever there's fear, there is also, there's your solution to move into. Only we don't really see it that way. So I want to share with you a little six step framework that will help to clarify the process that you'll go through to get from resistance to that vision that you have of yourself who is a person who's not in pain, who can do the things they love without fear. So you might find yourself at some spot on this six-step process. So let's say that for Annie, the vision she has for herself 
is she wants to get out of pain so she can do her work better. She can do her acting and dancing without fear of flaring up her stuff, without flaring up her symptoms. So the process that we need to go through is first, we need to see the facts. Then we need to see what's the truth. Then we need to see what is the demand of the situation. Fourth, we need to understand the effort we need to put in. Next, we need to see the transformation we need to take. And sixth, we need to see clearly the result. So let's break that down a little bit more. What are the facts? So for Annie, we'll just use her as an example. So for Annie, the fact is she's in pain and she can't seem to get out of it. Very simple. What's the truth? Because sometimes the truth and the facts are the same. So the truth is that Annie can't bring herself to prioritize the work. That's just what's happening right now. The truth is, look at your life. <laughs> what's actually going on? She can't prioritize the work. And she said that herself. To put it bluntly, the work right now isn't important enough for her to do it. Which leads us to number three. What's her demand? The demand is for her to see the importance of the work. If the truth is she is, isn't putting importance on the work, then the demand follows she needs to find a way to make it important. And this is not an intuitive thing to do because it goes against everything that she set up in her life, all the structures. To do this, she needs to have a clear vision of the result that she wants. If she wants to not live in pain, she needs to keep this in mind in order to make this important for her to do. So the demand will tell us what is the effort that needs to be undertaken. What exactly needs to be had done on a daily basis to make consistent progress forward. Now, I really love this word that I've been introduced to through some of the training that I've been doing. I like, I like the word sadhana. S-A-D-H-A-N-A. -A -A. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sadhana, sadhana, whatever. <laughs> so a sadhana or a sadhana, whatever. I'm going to get so messed up with that word. But basically, it means the effort that I need to undertake. It doesn't mean the perfection I must be right now. It just means what effort do I need to undertake and recognize that it will be effort. So for her, the effort she needs to undertake, it might be she just needs to block off five minutes a day in her calendar to start doing some work on one of the exercises she has in her toolkit already. Just put it in the calendar and see that this is the demand I have and the effort I need to make is to just do that five minutes. She doesn't need a complete overhaul all at once, just five minutes. Keep it realistic, but it also needs to be just a little outside the comfort zone so that it starts to get us used to feeling the resistance, but doing the thing anyway. Next, once she's started to do the daily effort, she can start to see what's the transformation that needs to happen. So the transformation for Annie might be to go from someone who isn't able to give herself even five minutes a day, focused 100% on the demand that she needs to live out, to transform to someone who can face her facts, who has the confidence and the courage and the discipline to do the work and put herself first and prioritize her body's demands for recovery and healing, and to be the kind of person who can say no to everything else getting in the way. Now, that's an amazing transformation. And it doesn't happen all at once. It happens by doing, doing the daily effort. And this leads us to the result, the final step here. The result is that Annie is able to live pain-free. The result, remember, is also bigger than you. It's a blessing for all when you can live out that result, when you are living out the vision you have for, for yourself. So we have to remember to see that becoming pain-free, living without pain and being able to engage in all the things we love, that's also a blessing for everyone else in our life. And in this way, when we can see the blessing that it is, when we achieve that result for ourselves, we can let go of any guilt that might have been there for feeling selfish about spending time doing the work. Because sometimes that's what comes up. 
we just feel a little guilty. Like we feel like, oh, if I'm taking this time for myself, then it makes it look like I'm a selfish person, which is absolutely not true. So some homework for you is I'd like you to put this framework to the test for yourself and see what comes up. It's really helpful for clarifying what we actually need to do. What are the facts? What's the truth? What's your demand? What is the daily effort you need to undertake? What's the transformation that you're going to make, that you need to make? And what's the result this will help you to live out? And this result will be a blessing for more than just yourself. It will be a blessing for all. Because, you know, when you're in pain, we're not necessarily the nicest people. I'm kind of a jerk when my body hurts. Like, I just am not nice. <laughs> or I pretend to be nice, and then me pretending to be nice makes me feel, like, just so exhausted trying to be someone I'm not. Anyway, let's get on with this. So let's talk more about resistance. So resistance is the thing that will make us fail to go through this process and get to our results of living pain-free. So we want to know what's going to make us fail. What limiting beliefs and fears, etc., will convince you that you don't need to take the action and do the daily efforts. And I can't speak specifically to Annie because we'd have to have a, a private conversation. But we can look at some of the most common forms that resistance takes that I've witnessed in others and in myself. Th these forms of resistance will cause us to fail if we can't catch them and name them and become aware of how they show up in our lives and prevent us from doing the work that we need to do. So let's, let's take a look at these now. Uh, before we do though, just remember one last thing, that this isn't an intellectual process. This is a very embodied thing. Remember, Annie already has the information and the support. She already has the intellectual stuff she needs. The problem is the resistance, and this resistance often lives in the body. It's in our biology. We're just hardwired to not do anything that seems like it's going to take more effort than we want it to, that we're accustomed to. So our bodies are inherently lazy, but that doesn't mean we can't change these things. As I like to say in the Liberated Body workshop to my students, liberating your body is more about waking up the part of you that's already free to do the work. The part of you that is free of resistance. We just need to wake that person up inside you. And that is really the first step to setting the body free from any sort of limitations. So I've come up with five or 15 common forms of resistance. And I want you to see if any of these resonate with you. Which ones of these do you identify with? Probably not everything will apply to you, but try to find the ones that do so that you can start to notice them coming up in your life. So number one, maybe you think that you need more information or that there's something out there, a magic product or a pill or an exercise program or a stretch or a book, and you put all of the power on that thing. But what's really necessary is for you to put 100% of your focus on you internally. Are you putting more emphasis on the external than the internal change that needs to happen? And maybe you don't know how to do this. You don't know how to put 100% of your focus on you because you've never done this before. This is your first time. And that's okay. When you're doing something for the first time, it's going to feel hard and it's going to feel foreign and it's going to feel kind of scary. And when you do, perhaps this is you, when you do put 100% of your focus on you, maybe it's scary to see the truth of how messy things have gotten. When you look at those facts and you see what's really going on, how you've neglected yourself, and you see how much effort it's actually gonna take to pull yourself out of this situation, it's just too much to deal with and you abort. This is me. Whenever I notice that things are going to take more effort than I want to put in, I quit. Are you doing this too? Or when you put 100% of the focus on you, do you feel guilty about that? Do you feel like, oh, I should be helping someone else, not myself? Do you feel guilty about putting that time to self-care for yourself? So you convince yourself that it's not really that important. You don't really want this. And so you get distracted with other things. 
that take you away from putting your attention on you. And these things might feel productive. They might be things that make it look like you're making progress, like you might go out for a jog or something, because that's, that's putting your focus on you and that's taking care of your body, right? Maybe not though, maybe that's not the thing you need to do. Maybe you need to do the opposite thing, like just lie for 10 minutes quietly and tune in and build up that fire to ignite yourself to do the work. Maybe just going for that jog is a distraction. It can be very tricky. So I just wanna talk about doing taxes because I think this is a good example from my own life. So I'm afraid to do my taxes. Every year this happens, I put it off to the last minute. And think of putting 100% of my focus on my demands as me doing my taxes. I know it doesn't seem like self-care, but what if self-care for me was doing my taxes to take care of my financial health? And what if for me, putting 100% 100 of my focus on doing my taxes is challenging and scary for me because I don't actually wanna see how bad I've let things go. And when I look at that, I just get overwhelmed and terrified. And so I avoid doing it and I avoid doing it. And then it becomes this big thing that just seems so impossible. And I keep telling myself, oh, it's not that important. I can just put it off, I'll be fine. I probably won't get audited. You know, I think that these odds are not going against me, but you know, I don't know what percentage chance it is that you'll get audited, but I think that those, those odds don't apply to me. Are you doing this with your body <laughs> like I'm doing with my taxes? Another example of this is, like I have a ton of containers in my fridge right now that are full of moldy, old, dirty stuff. And they're really nice glass containers. So I would definitely like to have those glass containers at my disposal. However, I really don't want to do the work of cleaning them out because I know it's going to smell nasty. Like those things have been in there for at least a year collecting mold. So I don't even want to look at them. What's more likely is I'm just going to throw the whole container out and convince myself that I don't want those containers that much. It's more important just to get rid of the problem than actually do the work. Ignore the problem, throw the whole container out instead of actually doing the thing that's hard, which is to clean them out and smell the nasty smell I'm going to have to smell. Like I just want to avoid doing the effort. <laughs> Are you doing this with your body? Are you avoiding doing the effort? So you just throw the whole thing out and convince yourself you never wanted it in the first place. These are the mind tricks that we do to ourselves. Anyway, let's move along to the next one. Number two, do you believe that you can't change? Now I wanna tell a story about a client of mine who was in a lot of pain. She had ankle pain, knee pain, hip pain, back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, all the pains. And yet she was a dancer and she wanted to keep moving and staying active and have a fitness routine. So I was happy to help her with that. And every day she'd show up and we'd try different exercises and things would hurt. And so I was trying to show her the exercises that she could use to help restore some options for movement that would eventually over time help to free her body so that she could move with a little bit more ease. But she was not having it. She was like, Monica, I don't want to do these subtle, small exercises to change the way I'm moving. It's like, just give me a bone here and let me do some more intense stuff so that I can get a workout. And so this was very interesting to me. It's like, well, you have these conflicting goals. You, you want to get out of pain, but you also don't want to do the work. So what's going on there? And eventually we got to talking after a couple of months of going through this frustrating cycle of me trying to show her a thing that I thought that she needed to do and her resisting it and asking for, you know, can't we just push the prowler up and down the gym a few times, you know? So what ended up coming up for her, she told me, I just don't believe I can change, you know, like I'm in my fifties. I can't change, right? Like I'm stuck like this forever. And I was like, whoa, that was just heartbreaking for me to hear. You know, the fact that she was there showing up there must have been a part of her that believed she could change, but I guess she just didn't believe it enough. But I want you to know that you can change. There's this thing called neuroplasticity, and it's a general rule of the universe. 
<laughs> of our nervous systems are hardwired for change. We can change if we give ourselves the right stimulus. She was not open to having that new stimulus. She just wanted to do the stuff she wanted to do to get a good workout. If she had been open, perhaps, to having a new experience doing one of these exercises that were intended to help her move a little bit more freely versus just grinding her body into the ground, then her body might have been given the opportunity to do something different. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I had the right answers for her and if only she did what I said, things would be fine. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that many, many of us have this belief system that we can't change, but know that the one of the only truths in this universe is that change happens. And we need to be open to doing the work to make that change happen. So believe that you can change. Moving on. I don't have time, AKA, it's not important enough to me. So this is the thing that, you know, it's talked about over and over and over again. Whenever someone says, I don't have time for this, what they're actually saying is, this is not a priority for me. So what this brings up is a lovely conversation about our values. And do you know what your highest values are? Many of us haven't taken the time to identify what our values are. For me, I can say my values are movement, learning, and when I'm not able to link things in my life to those values of movement and learning, then they're not important to me. So doing this right here is important to me because it relates back to my values of learning and movement. When I do things like this, I learn. And it links back to movement. I mean, this is all about changing the way we move and using movement to set our bodies free. So I made the time to do this. So what about Annie? She's not making the time to do this. What are her values? What is the most important thing to her? And can she link doing this work to those values? So how do we find out what our values are? Well, there are a lot of questionnaires on the interwebs that you can look up to look at what your values are. One of my favorite ones is actually a book by Dr. John Demartini called The Values Factor. I strongly recommend it. It takes you through a process of identifying what your values actually are. Not what you wish your values are, what your values actually are. Because sometimes what our values are, we'd rather not admit. <laughs> Especially when we have bad habits. Or not bad habits, but habits that aren't aligned with that vision we have for ourselves. So we want to get clear. What are our values? And is, the, is that excuse that I don't have time really just saying, I can't link this to my highest values. And can you find a way to link this thing, doing this work to your highest values? Um, an example I have from one of my clients who we were talking about this and she's not someone that really genuinely loves doing exercise for the sake of doing exercise. If it was up to her, she probably wouldn't do it at all. But what's really valuable to her in her life is she really cares about arts and culture. So she needs to be able to have the capacity to go to a theater and sit for a few hours to watch a show. And she needs to be able to be mobile so she can go out to these events that she likes to do. So the reason why she does the work on her body is so she can sit in a chair and be comfortable. And so that she's not in constant pain when she's out and about meeting people at these arts events and watching the shows and the theater she really loves. So when we linked the movement practice we were trying to develop for her back to her highest values of arts and culture and socializing, it became really clear that, yeah, this is really important to me. I ought to prioritize this. And then she started making the time for it. Moving on. So maybe this seems way too overwhelming for you to even start doing the work so you don't know where to begin. Now, this is kind of bullshit because <laughs> overwhelm is usually an indicator that you don't really have a system in place and it's really easy to find systems and the information is out there. Um, sometimes it's just an un the unwillingness to recruit the support that you need or the unwillingness to do a little bit of research to find the system that you need. The information is out there. You just have to go look for it. And maybe you have to spend a little bit of money, like 20 bucks or something for a book that will give you a framework so that you won't be overwhelmed by it. 
And the longer you put this off, you'll get more and more overwhelmed and it will seem more and more daunting and you, you'll feel like it's even harder to get started and convince yourself that it's not important anymore. That it can wait until later, until you, know, you have a bit more clarity. So this is like me with cleaning my apartment. I let it build up and build up and build up and the next thing I know it, it's three months later and there's a coating of dust on every single surface in my house and someone's coming over and I need to do this big deep clean and it's super stressful and I don't even know where to start. And then once I do get started, things get messier before they get cleaner. And I get just so scared about this whole shenanigan that I go through every single time I have to clean. And I know that it wouldn't be so bad if I just cleaned every week. So what I need to do is create a system for myself that holds me accountable so that every week I do the cleaning. Like I just need to put that system in place. So maybe I have a calendar and I put it in my calendar that every Friday at 5 p.m. I'm gonna just do a little wipe down of every surface in my house and that system will set me free. So maybe that's where the overwhelm is, that we just need a system, we need a little bit of accountability, we need to put it in the calendar so that we're actually gonna do the thing. Now here is a big one next. There's this fear that if we really commit to doing this daily effort, to getting the result that we want, that our entire life might have to change. And you might start to see that this demand is not just doing an exercise every day, but it also encompasses all of the things that you have to stop doing and letting go of some of the things that you're addicted to, some of the habits that you have that you know aren't serving you. And letting go of these things might make it seem like you have to become an entirely different person. And this is utterly terrifying because we're so attached to the familiarity of the identity we've built for ourselves and the routines and the habits that we have, even when they're keeping us in pain. So I wanna tell a little story about my own experience with this. And some of you might not guess looking at me or know this about me, but I used to be a compulsive overeater. I used to be anorexic and then I bounced back actually and developed a compulsive overeating problem, which is like an addiction to food and using food to escape the demands and numbing out. And I could see that I really needed to stop this habit, but that, that compulsion to use food to escape, it was so familiar and so comforting. And even though I knew that it was hurting me and preventing me from living the results that I wanted, I just couldn't stop doing it. I just, it became this habit of mine. Even though I knew rationally that it was stupid, I just couldn't stop it because the fear of seeing that new person I had to become was just so much. I didn't want to see that fear, so I just kept numbing myself out, numbing myself out. So for me, I used food to escape this fear of committing to the result that I needed. Maybe it's something else for you. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe it's TV. Maybe I also get addicted to books. <laughs> so who knows what the thing is for you. There's some wonderful stuff about this written by uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, and he speaks about addictions and the interesting forms they take, and they don't always take the form that we think they do. And he speaks about his addiction to buying classical music, believe it or not. And we often think of addictions and numbing as like drug abuse or alcohol abuse, but it can take the form of something so mundane and almost healthy you know like isn't listening to classical music such a beautiful thing so enriching for him it was an escape from things that he just didn't want to focus on you know and it took him away from his family it's a beautiful story he tells so i strongly recommend i think the book that i'm referencing where he tells this story is in search of hungry ghosts or something about hungry ghosts so uh, definitely check that book out. It's lovely. Anyway, let's move along. So maybe you have this belief that you don't think it'll work for you. So if you start doing the work, it's just not going to work. So it's not worth investing the time. So this might translate to 
Do you think that your special and the rule of if you put in the work, you'll reap what you sow doesn't apply to you? Because if it doesn't work instantly, it's not worth it. And you're so addicted to an instant gratification that if something doesn't immediately make a difference, you dismiss it as ever being effective. Because sometimes this work takes time. I'm a really good example of this. But I never had this thing where I didn't believe I needed to put work into the process. When it came to my physical body anyway and getting out of pain, I, I never had this issue or this belief that it needed to be instant. I knew it was going to be a long haul, but some of us think that it needs to be this instant thing where you just do one exercise and you're good forever. No. For me, it was definitely a process. I actually had to commit myself to doing just one exercise every single day for a year. And then eventually things started to shift for me. And, and I recognized even though now these days I'm mostly out of persistent pain. I don't have many symptoms that bother me. They're just kind of annoying little things, but I know what to do about them. But even so, I know that there is a certain number of days I can go without doing my work, after which some stuff will start to come up again. And like my neck pain will start again if I'm not doing my work. So I know that this is a long-term process and it's not an instant gratification thing. And so many of us are stuck in that cycle of needing instant gratification. And it's not your fault. Society has taught us that this is how we should be or that we can have things instantly and we can buy things and things will get better. And we're can just, you know, there's a magical thing you can purchase and your life will get better, but it doesn't work this way. I'm sorry. We have to face the truth and wake up to the demand and do the daily effort that we need to do. It will work for you if you do the work. So there's another fear that we might have that things will start to get worse. We might be doing the wrong thing and it'll make things worse. So we might as well just not do anything at all. But can you see the, the logical flaw in this? That things will get worse probably if you continue to do nothing. So you might as well start doing something, even if you don't know if it's the right thing. So you can rule it in or rule it out and then find something that does work as you go through a process of exploration. Now, maybe you're saying, I don't have the motivation. Like, I just can't find the motivation to do this. And again, this is you not taking responsibility for the effort that you need to take. And motivation, I want you to recognize is you relying on something external to spark the energy to do it. And what we have to find is the inspiration, which is that inner spark that wakes up in you to do it. It's something that a lot a lights up inside of you and says, I need to do this and I want to do this. And your need and your want become aligned. And then you just naturally start to do the thing without that inner debate about it. And we, when we can see the situation clearly before us, that's when we start to wake up. Something will automatically spark in us when we can see the situation for what it is without delusion. So we have to be able to see the facts. We have to be able to see the truth and see what the demand is and see what the effort is, see what the transformation is, and then we can start to get towards the result. But we have to see all of these things and then we are no longer relying on something external like a shoe, for example, or an orthotic, or saying that I'm just not, I need someone to keep me accountable because I, I don't have the motivation. This will no longer be an issue when something wakes up inside you to take the responsibility. And that happens when we can see the situation fully for what it is and being able to just be with it, no matter how uncomfortable it is to look at your truth, like for me, when I realized oh, I'm just like, I'm avoiding all the things I need to do because they're hard. And I just, I'm a big quitter. Like that was so hard for me to realize about myself. I'm just a big quitter. And when things get hard, I stop and I just get distracted with something else. When I saw that, something lit up inside me like, whoa, I don't want to be that way anymore. This is keeping me stuck. I need something to change. Now let's move on. We're getting close to the end here. This is number 11. Are you worried about what other people will think about you? Because we can get really invested in the image other people have created for us. So maybe Annie, you know, maybe she, people see her as this person who is, I don't know, she, she's strong. You know, she, 
she just is robust and resilient and she doesn't need to take the time to, to take care of herself because she's just good. You know, maybe people see her for something like that. And so maybe if Annie were to start taking the time to do self-care, people would look at her and go, whoa, that's not the Annie that I know. The Annie that I know is like, she doesn't need to slow down. She's strong and solid. So maybe Annie doesn't really feel like she can take the time to do this work because people won't recognize her anymore. And that almost feels like she's not her anymore. And like, who am I? And will people accept me for who I am? Will I still be, they have these friends and be accepted if I start acting differently? And all of us go through this fear. If they're really your friends, they will accept you when you start to take care of yourself, let me just say. And if they don't, if people will not accept you when you start to take care of yourself, then that's more their problem, not yours. And I think a lot of us wonder, will it look selfish if I take the time for myself? Remember, we need to start putting, for, to do this work, we need to start putting 100% of our focus on ourselves, even if just for five minutes a day. And that sounds a little selfish, doesn't it? But remember that it's not. You putting that focus on yourself is setting a nice example for others for how they can take care of themselves themselves. And it's also helping you to show up as the person that can be useful for other people and can be, be there for people that rely on you. But if you don't take care of yourself, like it's such a cliche thing to say, you know, but if, if you're not putting that oxygen mask on yourself first, then you can't possibly help the person next to you with theirs. I think a lot of us also think that people will look weird if we start doing these sometimes weird looking exercises. I know some of the exercises I give my clients to do, they look kind of strange, like they're not conventional things, but they work if you do them. So will people think I'm weird looking? And absolutely, that's a thing that I've bumped into. I remember when I started working out for the first time back in university, and I was really, un, un, um, not unconscious, I was really self-conscious about my body. So I didn't wanna go to a gym and let people see me working out in gym shorts and stuff. I was really weird about people watching me work out when I wasn't confident in the way my body work, looked. So I started working out at home and I would only do it when my roommates were out of the house. And I'd have to like make really sure, hey, are you gonna be out for the next hour? Cause I'm gonna work out and I don't want anyone to be around to see me. And it was really weird. And that little thing got in the way of me doing the work that I knew I needed to do. Because at that point in my life, strength training was absolutely important for my dance career. I needed to be strong enough to prevent injuries. So to do the work was important, but I was letting this little fear of someone's going to see me and they're going to see me struggling and I don't like the way I look when I do this. I look weird, so I don't want people to see me do this and I'm going to let that get in the way of me doing the work that I want to do. And so many times I just didn't do the stuff that I needed to do because my roommates were home. Now I have some clients that told me this too. They said things like, well, my kids are around, so I can't, I can't come to one of your online classes because my kids are in the house. Or my roommate's home and I, I really don't like uh, my roommate seeing me do this because I feel weird. I'm like, well, you know what? You could reframe that as you're setting an amazing example for your kids and for your roommate because you're taking this time to take care of you and like not giving a, a dang about what people think you look like. Like how powerful of, an, of a model is that for people in your life to see you just showing up as you and not giving a hot dang about it and Doing that self-care, you're going to teach people how to be the best versions of themselves. So remember that result is also a blessing for other people in your life that witness. Okay, we're getting close to the end here, guys. Stay with me. Number 12, maybe is your identity built around moving and exercising in a particular way? And the work that you need to do, like the daily exercise that you need to do, is not that thing. So for example, when I was a dancer, I was against anything that was dance specific, even doing yoga because it wasn't dance. <laughs> I was against all of that stuff. And what I needed was to cross train. So my demand was I need to do something different than dance so that I can take care of my body. But I was against it. I had so much resistance to doing it. So even though the excessive amount of dancing I was doing was hurting me. My identity was so invested in being that, being a dancer, being seen as a dancer, that I wouldn't do anything else. 
This also happens when we get addicted to intensity, which I'm actually jumping ahead and kind of blending this with point number 15 I was going to make, but actually I think these points can be merged together. So are you addicted to intensity, to that no pain, no gain thing? Are you unwilling to try a gentler way of doing something? Because the only way that you can feel your body is when you push 100% and do things hard style. Well, I hate to break it to you, but we can't operate at 100% capacity all the time. We can't even operate at 80% capacity all the time. I'm doing some meditational studies right now, and our teacher is telling us that we actually should be trying most of the time to be functioning at 20% of our effort so that when the time comes when we need to push, we have a reserve. He made the analogy of like a, a race car, like a Formula One car. Most of the time, that car is just resting in the garage so that maybe for this 1% of that car's life, it will actually push 100%. And then it gets wrecked. So when we push 100%, we kind of wreck ourselves, right? So what if we just flipped that to 20% effort 80% of the time? It's like a new sort of 80-20 rule. 80% of the time, you're giving 20% effort. And that's not meaning you're being lazy. Because what if being lazy is actually pushing too hard? Being lazy is often us finding a way of being productive to avoid the thing we need to do. And pushing really hard feels really productive. What if that's actually you avoiding doing that 20% easy way because it doesn't feel productive right now? Just a thought. This is definitely me. I am addicted to intensity. If I can't feel my body working hard, it doesn't feel like it's worth doing. And for me, doing the work actually meant I just need to spend 10 minutes a day kind of just lying on the floor and chilling the F out. This was scary because it was bringing up all of the challenging reasons why my body was hurting. When you're in stillness, you can kind of start to see the reality of what's there. And I think a lot of us stay busy and push and do intense exercise so that we don't have to look at our truth. But remember, first we need to see the facts and see the truth so that we can get to the actual work that we need to do. But getting still and going gentler and not going so intense so that we can see the truth, it's freaking scary because the truth isn't always what we want to see. Sorry, tough love. You got to look at the truth. And this leads me to the next point that taking the responsibility and effort that you know is scary. There's no doubt about it. But I think if you embrace that, there is great freedom in it. Know that it's going to be scary and do the thing anyway. And to live in this world where you think that you shouldn't be scared is delusional. And do you just want to escape into something that's more fun and interesting and enjoyable? And when things get hard and uninteresting and not fun, do you just want to quit and convince yourself it's not important because life should be fun and interesting and exciting all the time? This is my belief that life should be fun. And when things aren't fun and they're not easy and breezy, I don't put importance on them. However, if I remember, what's the result that I want? And I can link the things that I don't want to do with that result. I realize that actually I do want to do those things. They're just a little bit of effort or a little bit using my brain or my body differently than what I'm accustomed to. And so I just need to get comfortable with that different thing that I need to do. It's not even that scary. It's just different. And so I need to recognize that that resistance and the fear is actually the trigger to do the thing. There's this book that I came across early on in just when I got out of my dance career and started down this path of healing and body work and personal training and movement. This book called The Flinch by Julian Smith. And it was a free ebook at the time. And it was a super simple concept. And he was, uh, he was actually talking about resistance. When he talks about the flinch, it's that initial, ooh, I don't want to do that. That's hard. And he was saying, use that to your advantage. Whenever you notice that, that flinch pop in, like, ooh, I don't want to do that, that is your cue to stop thinking and just do it. Just, just do the thing. Stop the debate. Just do it. And the longer you think about it, the less likely you are to do the thing. 
kind of like me doing this <laughs> this video, to be honest, is I didn't really want to do it. Part of me did because I was excited about sharing this information, but there was another part of me that was like, oh, but what will people think about it? It's going to be hard work. I'll probably screw up and mum and stumble over my words and like maybe I'll look awkward on camera. But I just had to acknowledge that resistance for what it was. It's just resistance. It's not real necessarily. It's just a belief that I have. And to take the rule that Julian Smith wrote about in The Flinch is that's the trigger to do the thing. So the moment that you feel that resistance, that's your cue to do the thing. Don't think about it. Just do it. And we kind of need to do this when we're taking responsibility for our bodies. Put it in your calendar. Feel the resistance leading up to doing it. Like, oh, I don't really want to do that exercise. It's going to be hard. It's going to take too much focus. I don't want to do it. That's the resistance. Notice it. Don't think about it. Do it anyway. There's really no other way around it. Just have to try. And second to last thing we're going to cover, these common belief systems. Do you see doing the work as a punishment or do you see it as an act of self-love? This is a big thing. Can you reframe this? This is something I encounter every time I have to clean my house. And I'll use this example again because I actually don't have this problem when it comes to doing movement. I'm quite good at doing the work when it comes to the physical area of my life. When it comes to cleaning, I cannot do the work for the life of me. So I see cleaning my house as a punishment, but I can sometimes reframe it to, I like when my house is beautiful and clean. I like when it's decluttered, I feel calmer. I like the result of having a clean house. And so the work in order to get to that result is actually an act of self-love, not a punishment. Can you reframe that with movement for you? And it's part of making you sacred again. Making my home sacred, a sacred place for me, is making it clean and beautiful. So can you see doing the work as an act of self-love and not as a punishment? It's hard. You can do it. And lastly, Thanks for sticking with me through these long things I'm rambling on about. So are you unable to say no to the things or the people that you need to say no to in order to free up the space to say yes to doing the work? Because we can't just keep adding, 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 adding new things into our life without something having to give. So for example, to, to do what, one of the exercises I needed to do when I was taking care of myself maybe five, six years ago, there was one exercise that I knew if I just did it every day for a year, I would be better. But it was so hard to find five minutes to do that exercise because there were so many other things I was saying yes to that I couldn't say yes to doing this other thing. The thing that I had to say no to was just sitting down and scrolling through my phone like on social media, through stupid blogs that were just mindless garbage. I had to say no to doing that and say yes to just lying down on the floor and doing the work. So what do you need to say no to so that you can say yes to doing the work? Really think about that. There are things that you don't need to do that are just taking up your precious time from doing the work. Okay. So these are just some of the more common mindset things. It's definitely not a complete list, but we need to be able to identify these things and spot our patterns so that we can start to change them. This is how things change. Uh, it's just by us becoming aware of them, really. There's nothing we need to force if we start to force things, like there's a difference between an effort you're undertaking and forcing things before you're ready for them. Usually when you force things before you're ready, it leads to things like burnout, failure, and then disappointment because you feel like you can't follow through with the thing. So that puts you right back into the cycle of feeling like you can't do the work and the resistance comes up again. So change happens when something inside us wakes up to meet the truth and gives us no option but to act. One of the, the frameworks that was put down to me from one of my meditation teachers is that there's these three steps. First, we become conscious. We become conscious of the thing that we're doing that's keeping us 
stuck as we are. So maybe you identified one of those belief systems and suddenly, oh my God, I see if you're me, wow, I see how much I quit whenever things get hard and I convince myself it's not important and I just don't do it because it's no longer important. So you start to see that. First, you become conscious of that thing. Before it was unconscious. Suddenly, it's conscious. This is amazing. Next, you start to witness yourself making the mistake over and over and over again, wish, the one that you wish you could change. So I start, I'm now seeing, I'm witnessing every single time this is coming up. I need to do my taxes. Oh, I don't want to. That's going to be too hard. Oh, there it is again. I caught it. So the act of witnessing is just catching yourself in that belief system. You're not even doing anything about it yet. You're just catching yourself. And the more and more and more you catch yourself and be this witness to this thing that you're trying to catch, that's when you start to wake up into awareness and then change instantly happens without it feeling like you're forcing anything. It just, you suddenly feel like I have no option but to do the work. And change instantly will happen like this if you can sit long enough with that demand, with the effort that you know you need to take and witnessing that thing, that resistance that's getting in the way. So the more and more times I catch myself in this belief system that if, thing, if something is hard, I don't wanna do it and it's not worth doing unless it's easy. Sitting with this, catching it, that's what's going to lead us to the transformation. That's what's gonna lead me to the transformation I need to make so that I can actually live that result, which is for me just doing my freaking taxes on time for once. <laughs> now I want you to understand again, remember this is an embodied thing, it's not an intellectual thing. That act of witnessing, witnessing the, those mistakes that we keep making, it, it's really happening, it's an embodied thing. It's very real, it's very physical, it's in our biology. And before we can actually make a change in our habits or doing this work we need to do, the behavior sometimes needs to change first before our attitude changes about it. I think this is very interesting because it goes against the way we usually think. Usually we think we change our attitude and then we can change our behavior. But how does our attitude actually change about something? When we have an experience of it providing a positive result for us. And how do we get a positive result? By doing a thing. So we need to actually do the thing first to realize that it's useful and to change our attitudes about it. So first our biology, our body actually has to shift about it so that our mind can follow. This is why I think, especially when it comes to doing these self-care exercises, uh, movement explorations, movement practices that are to heal us and get us out of pain, we actually have to just do the dang exercise, feel how it helps us, and then use that fire to change our attitude about it over time. And it doesn't happen instantly. And this is what it means to embody the practice and not just think about doing it. Okay, so I know that was probably a lot. So I'd like to summarize what I talked about here and hopefully it'll help you. Hopefully, Annie, that shed a little bit of light on what might be coming up for you that's keeping you from doing the work. To summarize, it's not an intellectual problem. It's an embodiment thing. This is not something just to think about. We actually have to do it. And two, the resistance. This is the indicator of the thing you need to do. Whenever you feel the resistance, remember, it's like that flinch. Just do it. Don't think about it. Number three, the process we're going to go through requires that we see the facts, the truth, the demand, the daily effort, the transformation, and the results. We're going to go through that flow. And if we can spot ourselves, and what, identify what those things are for us. Get really clear on what the result is that you want. What are your facts? And fill in the blanks in between. And that's gonna give you clarity. Number four, we need, to, we need to know the results and know that it's bigger than you and know that it's a blessing for everyone when you finally will achieve that vision you have of your highest self. And if you can remember this, sometimes that's the hardest part, is just remembering this is bigger than you. Remember the result. Every day, if there's one thing you could do, just take 10 minutes to sit and think about or mind map 
or draw, whatever you do, journal about the results that you want for yourself and the vision you have that doing this work will lead you to. Remember that it's important because it's so easy to forget. Remembering to remember is the hardest part sometimes. What beliefs and fears and resistance are holding you back that you might be blind to? So if you could identify yourself in any of those things that I mentioned, then that's maybe just bringing to the surface something that now you can watch, watch as it comes up. First, you'll become conscious of it. Then you can start watching it happen and playing out in your life. Don't worry about doing anything about it yet, because the more you witness it, you'll reach a tipping point where you're just sick and tired of witnessing it, and something will wake up inside you, and you will just do the thing you need to do. Don't force it. And remember, lastly, if you take action first, your attitude will change as you begin to embody the practice. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say for now. I hope that that was useful for you in any way. And I'd like to throw out the challenge to you now to answer these questions for yourself. What is the result that you want for yourself? What is the daily effort that you think that you need to make now to get yourself to that result? And can you challenge yourself to start doing that? Just put it in your calendar in five minutes a day. Just do that thing you need to do and know that if you start doing the behavior, your attitude might change. It will change if you do it. And what are the beliefs and fears and resistance that are holding you back? If you can get clear on those things, these are really big barriers for people actually engaging in the work. And so many of my students deal with these things every day. And my students that do do the work, they are the ones that are getting the results. They're getting out of pain. They're moving better. They're finding their performance is improving and they're dancing and they're jogging and in their practices, their movement practices. And they're not afraid to ask for support. You know, they reach out sometimes and ask me, they send me a video. Can you look at this? They show up in the classes that I do weekly. They know that there's support there for them and they're not letting anything get, get in the way of showing up. So what's getting in your way of showing up? You don't need to come to a class, like you don't need to follow my exact things that I put out on the interwebs as options for how to do the work. But you know, what's getting in the way of you showing up to that class or those five minutes a day? Sit with that and I would love to hear what comes up for you. Okay. So I'm going to leave that there for today. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time.